Hello, so today I'll be going over Unit 4 of the AP Biology exam, which is Cell Communication and Cell Cycle. So for the AP exam, this waits to be about 10 to 15% of the content that you will see on the exam come May. So, concept 5.6, the plasma membrane plays a key role in most cell signaling. In multicellular organisms, cell-to-cell -cell communication allows the cells of the body to coordinate their activities. Communication between cells is also essential for many unicellular organisms. So in the cell, we have local and long-distance signaling. So eukaryotic cells may communicate by direct contact. Animal and plant cells have junctions that directly connect the cytoplasm of adjacent cells. These are called gap junctions, animal cells and plasmodus mata in plant cells. So basically, in your animal and plant cells, you have these different areas or junctions that directly connect the cytoplasm of adjacent cells. So what are they called in animal cells? They're called gap junctions or in plant cells, plasmodus mata. So the free passage of substances in the cytosol from one cell to another is a specific type of local signaling. So in many other cases of local signaling, messenger molecules are secreted by a signaling cell. So what's what does this mean exactly? So we know that secretion in biology is to form and release a substance. So in this case, it is basically saying that messenger molecules are forming and release some kind of substance or molecule by a signaling cell. And these messenger molecules, also known as local regulators, travel only short distances. So one class of these growth factors stimulates nearby cells to grow and divide. So local signaling in animal cells is called paracrine signaling, and this is something you should remember for your exam. So just think paracrine local signaling. So here's a brief picture of what goes on here. So here we have our paracrine signaling. So this is our secreting cell and this is our target cell. And your local regulator diffuses through extracellular fluid. So basically a secreting cell acts on nearby target cells by discharging molecules of a local regulator, such as a growth factor, for example, into the extracellular fluid. And what is paracrine signaling? It is local signaling. So another more specialized type of local signaling occurs in the animal nervous system. So this synaptic signaling consists of an electrical signal moving along a nerve cell that triggers secretion of neurotransmitter molecules. So these diffuse across the space between the nerve cell and its target, triggering a response in the target cell. So this kind of sounds like a handful of words, but I'll break it down to you more with this good visual. So basically what's happening here is a nerve cell releases neurotransmitter molecules into a synapse, which stimulates the target cell. So basically this is our electrical signal along nerve cell and it triggers the release of our neurotransmitters and our neurotransmitters diffuse across the synapse, stimulating our target cell. So then we have long distance signaling. And in long distance signaling, plants and animals use chemicals called hormones. So in hormonal signaling in animals, which is also known as endocrine signaling, specialized cells release hormones. So what you wanna remember for your test is endocrine signaling is long distance signaling, which is hormonal signaling. So in this signaling, specialized cells release hormone molecules that travel via the circulatory system, and hormones can vary widely in size and shape. So then this is our endocrine or hormonal signaling. So what is happening here is basically the specialized endocrine cells secrete hormones into the body fluids, oftentimes the blood. So hormones reach virtually all body cells, but are only bound by some cells. So here we have our endocrine cell, this is our blood vessel, and we are secreting these hormones into body fluids, usually along like the bloodstream. So our hormones travel in the bloodstream, and then this is our target cell, which specifically binds hormones. So next, the three stages of cell signaling. So Earl W. Sutherland discovered how the hormone epinephrine acts on cells. So Sutherland suggested that cells receive signals and in these three processes, reception, transduction, and response, which we will go into. But you should really know that cell signaling happens in three processes, reception, transduction, and response. So these are some pictures. So this is reception. So we have our signaling molecule, which you'll learn later is also known as a ligand, and it binds to your receptor molecule. 
And then we have transduction. So these are our relay molecules, which is the second step. And then we have response, so our activation. So our first step is reception. Reception is the binding of a signaling molecule to a receptor protein. So the binding between a signal molecule, the ligand, and the receptor is highly specific. So this means that it causes a shape change in the receptor. Many receptors are directly activated by this shape change, and most signal receptors are plasma membrane proteins. So to go back to this picture here, this is our receptor protein, and this is our signaling molecule. And now usually there's some sort of shape change here to allow for this molecule to bind to our receptor protein. So receptors in the plasma membrane. Most water-soluble signal molecules bind to specific sites on receptor proteins that span the plasma membrane. So we know that our plasma membrane has a hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. So the hydrophilic means that they are polar or water-soluble. So these water-soluble signal molecules bind to specific sites on receptor proteins that span the plasma membrane. And there are two main types of membrane receptors. So we have our G-protein coupled receptors or our ligand-gated ion channels. So our G-protein coupled receptors, also known as the GPCRs, are plasma membrane receptors that work with the help of a G-protein. So G-proteins bind to the energy-rich molecule GTP. Basically, that just means it has a lot of available energy. And the G protein acts as an off switch. So if GTP is bound to the G protein, the G protein becomes inactive. So it just turns it off. And many G proteins are very similar in structure. GPCR pathways are extremely diverse in function. So here is a picture of this happening. Basically, you have your activated GPCR in your signaling molecule. And this is all in the plasma membrane. And you have your activated G protein here by your GTP. And this is your inactive enzyme. So as we heard before, basically when the appropriate signaling molecule binds to the extracellular side of the receptor, the receptor is activated and changes shape. Its cytoplasmic side then binds and activates G protein, and the activated G protein carries the GTP molecule. The activated G protein leaves the receptor, diffuses across the membrane, and then binds to an enzyme altering the enzyme shape and activity. Once activated, the enzyme can trigger the next step, leading to a cellular response. Binding of signaling molecules is reversible, and the activating change in the GPCR, as well as the changes in the G protein and enzyme, are only temporary. These molecules soon become available for reuse. So as you can see here, we have our activated GPCR, our signaling molecule. You can see that this goes to our activated enzyme and activates it, causing a cellular response. <clears throat> so receptors in the plasma membrane. A ligand-gated ion channel receptor acts as a gate for ions when the receptor changes shape. When a signal molecule binds as a ligand to the receptor, the gate allows specific ions such as sodium plus or calcium 2 plus through a channel in the receptor. Ligand-gated ion channels are very important in the nervous system. The diffusion of ions through open channels may trigger an electrical signal. So to give you a visual of what is essentially happening here, so in step one, we have our signaling molecule and the guy, and also known as the ligand. We have our ligand-gated ion receptor and our gate-closed ions. So here we show a ligand-gated ion channel receptor in which the gate remains closed until a ligand binds to the receptor. And then in step two, when the ligand binds to the receptor, the gate opens and specific ions can now flow through this channel and rapidly change the concentration of the particular ions inside of the cell. This change may directly affect the activity of the cell in some way. So which means, so here we have our ions and they have flowed through here, they've changed the concentration and now we've caused some sort of cellular response. And then in step three here, oh, what happened? Where did we go? In step three here, when the ligand dissociates from the receptor, the gate closes and ions no longer enter the cell. <clears throat> so receptors in the plasma membrane. Intracellular receptor proteins are found in the cytosol or nucleus of target cells. Small or hydrophobic chemical messengers can readily cross the membrane and activate receptors. Examples of hydrophobic messengers are the steroid and thyroid hormones of animals and nitric oxide in both plant and animals. 
Testosterone behaves similarly to other steroid hormones. Only cells that contain receptors for testosterone can respond to it. The hormone binds the receptor protein and activates it. The active form of the receptor enters the nucleus, acts as a transcription factor, and activates genes needed for male sex characteristics. So what is a transcription factor, you may ask? Well, what is transcription? Transcription is the process that turns DNA to RNA to a protein. So if the active form of the receptor enters the nucleus, this is going to act as a factor in turning our DNA to RNA to protein, which then will activate genes needed for male sex characteristics. So here is a good visual of this going on right here. So in step one over here, we have the steroid hormone testosterone that passes through the plasma membrane. So here's our testosterone. It's passing through the plasma membrane. So, and then the testosterone is binding to a receptor protein in the cytoplasm, thus activating it. So here in the hormone receptor complex, this hormone, this hormone testosterone binds to our receptor protein, and seen here, it has been activated. So then in step three here, the hormone receptor complex enters the nucleus and, and binds to specific genes. The bound protein acts as a transcription factor, stimulating the transcription of the gene into RNA. So here, a transcription factor, DNA to RNA. And the mRNA is translated into a specific protein. So here we go. So we have our hormone testosterone, binds to a receptor protein and activates it. And then here it acts as a transcription factor, turning DNA to RNA, thus creating a new protein. So transduction by cascades of molecular interactions. Signal transduction usually involves multiple steps. Multi-step pathways can amplify a signal. A few molecules can produce a large cellular response. Multi-step pathways provide more opportunities for coordination and regulation of the cellular response than simpler systems do. The molecules that relay a signal from receptor to response are mostly proteins. Like falling dominoes, the receptor activates another protein, which activates another, and which activates another, and so on, until the protein producing the response is activated. At each step, the signal is transduced into a different form, usually a shape change in a protein. So this is a big concept, so I want to go over this again. So the molecules that relay a signal from receptor to response are mostly proteins. So the receptor activates another protein, which then activates another protein, which then activates another protein, and so on, producing the response activated. And this is known as transduction. So at each, step, at each step, the signal is transduced into a different form until a shape change in a protein. Protein phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Phosphorylation and dephosphorylation are a widespread cellular mechanism for regulating protein activity. So our protein kinases transfer phosphates from ATP to protein, a process called phosphorylation. So as we learned in previous units, phosphorylation is a process in which you add a phosphate to ADP to turn it into ATP. That makes sense because you're taking adenosine diphosphate, adding a phosphate, and turning it into adenosine triphosphate. So these protein kinases transfer phosphates from ATP to protein, also known as phosphorylation. So the addition of phosphate groups often changes the form of a protein from inactive to active. So by adding these phosphates, you are basically activating this protein. So protein phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, this is basically our graph of what is going on here. So in the signal, basically you have your signaling molecule. What is that known as? Your ligand. And your ligand binds to the receptor protein. So then here in this Thing, in a phosphorylation cascade, a series of different molecules in a pathway are phosphorylated in turn, each molecule adding a phosphate group to the next one in line. Dephosphorylation returns the molecule to its inactive form. So in step one, basically right here, a relay molecule activates protein kinase 1. So this is our relay molecule and it activates protein kinase 1. In step two here, Active protein kinase 1 activates protein kinase 2. And then in step 3 here, active protease kinase 2 phosphorylates a protein that brings about the cell's response to the signal. And then in step 4, which is around here, protein phosphates catalyze the removal of the phosphate groups from the proteins, making them inactive again. 
So this is a long process, but this is basically our phosphorylation cascade. And where does this happen? This happens during transduction. So protein phosphates remove the phosphates from proteins, a process called dephosphorylation. Phosphates provide a mechanism for turning off the signal transduction pathway. They also make protein kinases available for reuse, enabling the cell to respond to the signal again. Small molecules and ions as second messengers. So the extracellular signal molecule, also known as the ligand, that binds to the receptor is a pathway's first messenger. Second messengers are small, non-protein, water-soluble molecules or ions that spread throughout a cell by diffusion. So what is diffusion? Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to low concentration. So these second messengers, which are small, they are not proteins, and they are water-soluble molecules, and they spread through the process of diffusion. So our cyclic AMP and calcium ions are common second messengers. So cyclic AMP, also known as CAMP, is one of the most widely used second messengers. Adenyl cyclase, an enzyme, how do we know it's an enzyme? Because it has this ACE added to the end. In the plasma membrane, rapidly converts ATP to cyclic AMP in response to a number of extracellular signals. The immediate effect of cyclic AMP is usually the activation of protein kinase A, which then phosphorylates a variety of other proteins. So here's a picture of what's happening here. So basically, our first messenger, the signaling molecule, such as epinephrine in this case. So what's our first messenger called? A ligand. It binds to our receptor protein. So then the first messenger activates a G protein coupled receptor, which activates a specific G protein here in this step. In turn, the G protein activates adenyl cyclase, which catalyzes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP in this step here. And then the cyclic AMP then acts as a second messenger and activates another protein, usually protein kinase A, leading to cellular responses. So let's go through that one more time. So we have our first messenger here that binds to our protein receptor. So our G protein coupled re receptor then activates our specific G protein. And then our G protein activates the adenyl cyclase enzyme which catalyzes this reaction here, activating our protein kinase A, thus leading to a cellular response. <clears throat> so response, which is our third step of the cell signaling. What are our three steps? We have, what have we learned before? So we start with our reception, then we go to transduction, then we have our response. So reception, transduction, response. So here, our response, regulation of transcription or cytoplasmic activities. So ultimately, a signal transduction pathway leads to regulation of one or more cellular activities. The response may occur in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. Many signaling pathways regulate the synthesis of enzymes or other proteins, usually by turning genes on or off in the nucleus. The final activated molecule in the signaling pathway may function as a transcription factor. So here's yet another photo of what is going on here. So basically we have our growth factor, our ligand, which binds to our receptor proteins. This is step one, reception. Then step two, transduction, our phosphorylation cascade occurs. So the ATP molecules and phosphate groups, which aren't shown here, but basically what we just talked about before, our phosphorylation cascade. Then step three, response. So in step three, we have once phosphorylated, the last kinase in the sequence enters the nucleus and activates a transcription factor, which stimulates transcription of a specific gene. The resulting RNA then directs the synthesis of a particular protein in the cytoplasm. So response, regulation of transcription or cytoplasmic activities. Other pathways regulate the activity of enzymes rather than their synthesis, such as the opening of an ion channel or a change in cell metabolism. The evolution of cell signaling. 
Biologists have discovered some universal mechanisms of cellular regulation, evidence of the evolutionary relatedness of all life. Scientists think that signaling mechanisms first evolved in ancient prokaryotes and single-celled eukaryotes. These mechanisms were adopted for new uses in their multicellular descendants. So, feedback mechanisms. Organisms use feedback mechanisms to maintain their internal environments and respond to environmental changes. So basically what happens here in the internal and external parts of the cell, environments are constantly changing and we want to keep them stable. So homeostasis is the maintenance of a stable internal environment. So if you kind of think of these things on a scale and you're trying to, or like a seesaw and you're trying to keep them straight, our feedback mechanisms or processes used to maintain this stability or homeostasis by increasing or decreasing a cellular response to an event. So in these feedback mechanisms, we have either positive or negative feedback mechanisms. So our negative feedback mechanisms maintain homeostasis for a particular cell condition. So negative feedback mechanisms maintain homeostasis for a particular condition by regulating philosophical processes. So if a system is disrupted, the negative feedback mechanisms return the system back to its target set point. These processes can operate at the molecular and cellular levels. So if you visualize this as like a seesaw, something has disrupted this. So we put a lot of weight on one side of the seesaw and it is kind of not stable anymore. So in this negative feedback system, we are going to produce a mechanism that's going to bring back the stability to our seesaw and make it level and stable again. And the other end, our positive feedback mechanisms. So these actually amplify responses and processes in biological organisms. So the variable initiating the response is moved farther away from the initial set point, disrupting homeostasis. So if we use our seesaw example again, instead of being a negative feedback that actually tries to bring our seesaw back to stability, in this case, we're going to apply more weight to one side, making it more unstable until the cells produce something to actually be like, oh, no, this is going wrong, and we want to bring it back to our stable homeostasis. So amplification occurs when the stimulus is further activated, which in turn indicates an additional response that produces system change. So the next part of the cell cycle, I suggest you watch this video because I actually found this immensely helpful for the cell cycle.